Hey, thank you for joining us for Next Up. We have a great guest, very timely. Congressman John Shimkus of Illinois, thank you for joining us. I know that you have a lot of thoughts on what's going on in Ukraine, and we'll delve right into it. Let me open up with, uh, if you could just tell us your feelings right now and, and what do you think is going to happen in maybe the next 24 to 48 hours. Well, I'm heartbroken, like everyone who believes in democracy, freedom, self-determination of a population. The last time I was, well, not the last time, but I was there for the presidential election of Zelensky. Uh, observed those elections. These people want freedom. They want their independence, and Putin's taken away from them. Um, if you look at the conflict area now, uh, off the maps, it gets updated all the time. I think Putin's all in, which means all in all the way to to Kiev and all the way to uh, the border to reinstall a, a a government more suited to his liking, and and that's unfortunate for the world order. I think. Congressman, uh, you served 24 years in Congress, and you were known for being able to work across the aisle. There's an old adage that is seems to have been forgotten, which is that politics should stop at the water's edge. And this is probably as close to a serious uh, uh, an event since World War II in Europe. Um, do you see any hope of uh, getting back in some fashion, uh, given that most people across the party lines, not all, uh, view v Vladimir Putin as a dangerous, uh, possibly uh, demented dictator. Um, can we get back there at all? Well, if, if, if conflict in, in a world that we're living in right now doesn't get people to work together and kind of put aside kind of the parts. I'm, I'm kind of sick and tired of this nitpicking right now. We ought to be behind the, the president who's trying to uh, uh, keep our allies together and uh, form a, a grand alliance against a, a totalitarian dictator who's willing to kill. He's claiming them to be his own people, and he's willing to kill them. So uh, uh, there will be members uh, that will rise to the occasion. Um, but you know what? They're not the storyline, right? <laughs> They're not going to get covered. Because uh, who will get covered are are the people that are fomenting uh, these these attacks, which I think is untimely right now. Well, as as far as military response, uh, obviously there's economic, and and they've grown stronger today with the president's speech. But as far as the military is concerned, is it could we be drawn into that? Um, are are is there just no way we would actually risk American lives in this conflict? Well, if, if Ukraine was a NATO ally, I don't think Putin would ever come in. Uh, but they're not, and they want they were wanting to, to get there. Uh, there's no way any of the NATO countries are going to go in, uh, in in this moment. At, before the attack, you know, I, I was wondering if uh, Zelensky would appeal and create some bilateral relationships. I believe in the tripwire. I served in West Germany, and I you know, I was basically a tripwire should that had gone off. We would have slowed him down a little bit, but not very long. Um, but I think you can watch the comments from not just uh, President Biden, but all the world leaders. Uh, they are strengthening the uh, eastern border of the NATO alliance. Uh, there, will, there will not be a movement to go into Ukraine. Now, if Putin decides to cross the line, uh, to any one of our, our NATO allies, Article 5 of the treaty is uh, attack on one is an attack on all, and uh, no one wants to see that. Uh, and thank you for your service. Uh, how do you calibrate that, though? In other words, um, we're talking about nuclear superpowers, and so any uh, the uh, invoking Article 5 at NATO on one hand, just sounds like, you know, that's NATO and it would be a, you know, a standoff. We're talking about the potential for nuclear war. How do you, how can we calibrate? Because in, as you identified in this, in this uh, climate uh, being so divided, it, it's hard to keep national unity. What, what do you see happen? It, it, do you even want to speculate? But I mean, do you see my question? In other words, how, how do we calibrate going forward right. if we did have uh, 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 to engage NATO uh, to stand up to Russia directly? 
Well, you know, the, the Constitution, it lays out the whole declaration of war issue, which hasn't been used, you know, for, gosh, over 80 years now. And, and so, um, so we've always had this debate of who can deploy forces and who can and how long and the War Powers Act and all these things. I would just, I would just boil it down to we have a treaty, and I'm a big believer, and that's part of the Constitution, a, a treaty signed by the executive branch, affirmed by the legislative branch. Uh, that's it, you know. Uh, I think the real debate, Ray, is um, would the NATO troops, NATO countries really go to all-out war with Russia for these countries I know very well and I love, the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, total population of those three countries is probably 8 million. Uh, would we really do that? Um, and I helped push their enlargement. Um, they're very happy that they're in NATO. They have deployed with our troops all the crazy places that we've sent our troops. Um, and I, I, I believe the answer is yes, but you can understand why they would be concerned. Well, you mentioned installment of his puppet government, but but what does Putin want? What is he getting out of this? I mean, you've got, what, 90% of the world thinking that the man has lost his mind. What is he actually getting out of this? Yeah, I always believe that. And I always, I've asked this question for 20 years. I've been anti-Putin for 20 years. Uh, countries grow and prosper when they live in peace and harmony. So if you're on these borders of, of the Russian state and you see uh, Western democracy and capitalism causing these countries to grow and thrive, and you don't kind of connect into that for economic growth of your people, but shut that down, it, it only speaks to one thing. Uh, he, I, he wants to re reclaim uh, the empire. I mean, this is just historical significance going back to not just the Soviet Union, but going back to Tsarist Russia. Uh, the, uh, and so I think that is, uh, they feel, I've read the statements, they feel um, um, uh, 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 actually misaligned or whatever the proper word should be because of uh, the expansion of NATO. Um, but NATO is a defensive alliance. NATO offers no threat. Uh, only these countries want the protection, this, this protection of this uh, safety umbrella. Um, I think it's Mother Russia and prestige and to get uh, Russia back on the world stage to seen as an equal power. Well, uh, Congressman, you know, those have, the very few people who have actually defended uh, uh, Putin really in a full-throated way in our country include you know, Tucker Carlson, the Fox host, and uh, our own senator in Missouri, Josh Hawley, who's you know basically came out and said we should have agreed with Vladimir Putin to take the position that Ukraine could never be in NATO. Yeah. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, our position has our bipartisan position is we don't tell countries like Ukraine who they get to form alliances with. Am I right? And, and so my question is, um, I mean, if, and it looks tragically like it's going to happen, Russia puts in a puppet government in Ukraine, don't, and because they were concerned about them bordering the, so, the old Soviet Union, Russia, well, now don't they have the same border with Poland and other countries that they then in turn jeopardize? Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, let me totally reject Tucker Carlson and, and, oh. and Senator Hawley. I mean, just terrible, terrible. Um, and you were right in your intro to the, the question is that, listen, the position of NATO and our European allies is that there is, there is an open door and no other country can veto the admission. So what Russia has been trying to do for decades is trying to say, no, these countries near our border cannot come in. Uh, you saw that pressure these last two weeks. That's what he was trying to negotiate. Not only that, he wanted he wanted us to kick out the the Eastern European countries that are already in NATO. NATO, by definition, is a defensive alliance, and also it's it is a consensus based organization, which means every, I think there's like 26 countries in there now. Every country has to agree. Now, 
if you're Latvia or Estonia, Lithuania, you're not going to agree to get thrown out of NATO because that's your lifeblood right now, especially with, with Ukraine. So uh, uh, it, it's foolhardy. It, I, I don't understand their reading of history. I would never appease a totalitarian dictator. And that's it reminds me of, you know, Hitler and Neville Chamberlain waving the, you know, peace in our time. Well, freaking there's no peace in our time, you know? So I, I'm very disappointed. Those guys are viewed as uh, obviously conservative Republicans and, uh, and I reject that position. Are you um, are you happy with the sanctions so far? Is there anything more that you would like to see the administration do at this time? Yeah, I was asked that earlier. You know, I really, the financial markets, world trade, tech, I don't get all that stuff. Um, uh, I got to believe that they're ratcheting down as much as they can. And, uh, you know, I don't, you know, I the, some of the, at the press conference, the question of, well, have, are you going to freeze Putin's accounts? You know, and I don't know. I would. I'm not sure how that all works. I would. If, they, I could, if I could find them on my computer right here, I would. <laughs> yeah, and then they're talking about some ZISC agreement, which I didn't know what that was. But the president kept saying, no, these are harder than those. Why didn't he just say, yeah, let's do the ZISC agreements. Let's let's be all in. So, I, again, I don't understand the financial markets. Um, and, and But I do agree with the president that when you do these, you don't see immediate effect, right? These are these will the pain will come down the road. So to expect us to say we're going to do this and to, for that to stop Putin, that's not. But that is really setting a marker down that this is not just a here and now. This is a long term, and and really the, the European allies have to be all in. All it takes is for one to break, and then you, you've lost it. I mean, look at the map and look at the uh, the petro state that they are. And the pipelines that are going, they're going uh, east to west. Um, so that's uh, uh, obviously a concern for our European allies. Speaking of pain and petrol, <laughs> uh, there's very little doubt that Americans are going to feel the any uh, the sanctions that we put on Russia at the fuel pump. Uh, what, do you have any, as a leader, do you have any message for people about how we, again, ideally as Americans and not as partisans, how, how should people react to that? In other words, can, can we get back to the shared sacrifice of World War II, or is it going to be a campaign issue that fuel prices went up this year in an election year? Well, I'm a politician. I mean, it's always... Bad things are always going to be a campaign issue, sure. whether they're fair or justified or not. It's just, it's That's just the, just how we <laughs> operate. Uh, we have high prices now. Before this, um, you know, I'm a big fossil fuel guy, so uh, we, you know, the the country has been historically in a fairly good shape with our own ability to pump our own oil, refine our own, and get it. Uh, we do export now, even uh, crude oil which we hadn't, we didn't do 10, 10 years ago. So, but when you start putting uh, these products on the world market, right, then you have this, yeah, I'm a simple supply and demand guy. Uh, when supply goes down and demand is the same or demand goes up, the prices is going to do it, send signals. And, and the signal it should send is we should do more to get more crude oil, or we should do more to get more refining. Uh, you can't build a refinery overnight. Uh, but I, and, and this is, I think the attack on fossil fuels does hurt us in 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 times like this. I want to have a Donny Brook about to bring in the clean clean air, you know whatever kind of thing. But let's not do that. We're, we can bring it out for that. The let me ask you this, if I can, Alan, a follow up question sure. is: We just to clarify, we don't buy much oil from Russia, correct? It's more that's matter. correct. No, we don't. I just wanted to. Make sure. No, that. no, no, that's right. But you know, so in Lithuania, which I know real well, uh, they were foresighted enough that years ago, and Poland is too. They have LNG terminals. Mm -hmm. They they were looking for a time like this. They didn't want to be dependent. So now uh, the natural gas that's on the world market is going, you know, over there, and good for them. You know what they named the uh, the terminal in Lithuania? Uh, freedom. So that's and because they they've experienced Russian extortion in in a crude oil. 
Yeah, overnight, um, uh, convenience bar shot up three dollars and forty four cent. Um, you know, I, I get it someplace else, and it, it hadn't gone up, but I'm sure it will. So Americans already feeling it. Um, you you would know better than than us, uh, your average Russian who who is an auto mechanic or who works in a movie theater, who just has a job, you know, and is a what a middle class uh, individual with a family. What is this? How is this going to impact those families and those people? Yeah, well, they're going to feel a lot of pain, but see, dictators don't mind that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're dictators. And so, uh, and, and they prey on their fears. This whole part is, is part of a, a fear campaign that the West is coming after Mother Russia. So we're defending. So that helps Putin stay in power. That's how dictators stay in power. So they're willing to, to deprive their citizens of livelihood to uh, to update. So how did the, how did the Russian military get so strong and so big? Well, all that all that uh, petrol state dollars of selling crude oil and natural gas. It did it go to the Russian people? No, it didn't go to Russian people. It went to Putin and it went to his oligarchs and it went to the military. Uh, so he really cares less about the average uh, Russian citizen, and, and that's sad. You know, the idea of how this, what will undoubtedly be a refugee crisis is going to play out. I mean, we already saw images last night on, I was watching all three uh, cable networks of just unbelievable lines of cars, you know, headed, headed out of, out of uh, Kiev. And um, I mean, they got to go somewhere. And we're going to have that issue that comes with every one of these. Uh, well, remember, yeah, remember, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, remember, well, this is, I, asked, I was curious yeah, what, if this you is, have any insight into it, what we might expect. Well, this is this is uh, Europe. So these are Western uh, states, and there's been a lot of immigration into European Union. I think a lot of those people have places to go. They yeah. have aunts and uncles, grandma and grandpas, sons and daughters, somewhere in the Europe, and they're going to try to get there. I don't think you're going to see like the, uh, the Syria refugee issue, or you see in, uh, you know, car coming across from North Africa. I could be wrong. You're not going to see these folks in big tent cities and, and you know, w with handoffs. I, 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 you may have transition, but uh, I don't believe, I just don't see that happening. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to follow up on that, and I say, like, there no such thing as a, as a, Silly question because I I don't know, but from just what you were saying, if I was citizen of Ukraine, and this was starting, you know, and, and as you know, the United States has been aware for months that he's up to something and it's looking like he's, you know, going to go into this country. Three months ago, I could have left. I I, I could have just left. There's no nothing holding me in Ukraine right. other than maybe having you know having whatever passport I needed. But I could have left. And I'm not saying people should have left. I'm just saying that was a that was a possibility. No, no, you're right. I think, you know, I th the uh, Ukrainians. I, they're it's an interesting relationship uh, because they they are somewhat ethnically related. The languages are very close, but they are different. So I think there's some. You, you read the, the account. Some are saying they're brothers. You know, mm -hmm. they're not going to attack us. You know, uh, my my sister lives in in Moscow. You know, this, is, this is family, so this is not going to happen. So then the, the flip side of this debate is, will, will some people just say, okay, it's a new regime, I'm going to stay, and I'll learn to live under this? I, the question I've been asking, because a lot of, there are some hardened Ukrainian fighters that have been in the trenches and been to the east side, and the question will be, will there be a fomented in, internal, you know, insurgency that will really disrupt this stuff uh and what will the general population do you saw all the pictures of the 90 year old woman you know you know taking weapons uh training uh, will it go that far i just don't know um if, will they are they willing to fight to death for their country uh against overwhelming odds uh, we're going to find out real soon uh congressman from your experience in congress uh with some emphasis on or focus on Ukraine. Can you tell us anything about uh, Mr. Zelensky from 
maybe a different perspective. And I, I say that because, I mean, it's such a bizarre thing to think about. This guy is a TV star in Russia, okay? <laughs> and a comedian and stuff. And now he's in this unbelievable spot. Um, is he up to, I mean, can, what can you tell us about it? Well, uh, the only thing I know is um, I was there for his election. You know, I was there a couple days before and a couple days after. Uh, I watched the debate. They had a big debate at the uh, soccer stadium. And the people I was with, they didn't really know if Zelensky really could speak Ukrainian, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's been so much of a TV personality in Russia. Um, so when he was able to go right into Ukrainian dialect, that it surprised even some of the inside Ukrainian people that I was with, uh, which shows you that uh, he, he rose to power based upon uh, his TV show, right? And uh, maybe he got more than he bargained for. Uh, I mean, his TV show was a reformer, uh, you know, trying to, you know, Ukraine still has, uh, you know, histor historical corruption and all those problems. Even the last president, Poroshenko, um, who who's also a fairly strong leader, was trying to move to the West. Um, you know, the, the people rejected that because they thought he was still not totally clean. So that's when they moved to to Zelensky. And um, yeah, he's got his. He, he really has his hands fired. I really I pray for him because uh, I think his heart was right. I mean, I, he didn't do this out of self. I, you know, self uh, raising his himself up. Oh, he was a TV star, right? Why would you do this? I, I think it was for the country, and and uh, the uh, Putin cannot accept uh, uh, a democratic free Ukraine as a neighbor. Uh, what could possibly go wrong if you elect a guy from a TV show as president of your country? <laughs> yeah. um, in our last five I'm minutes, I'm not taking here, a bait. I'm not taking a bait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was that was too easy. Uh, in the last five minutes, I just maybe talk about some domestic politics here. Um, are, are you familiar with our uh, base for uh, Roy Blunt is stepping down and joining you probably and, and being probably be, be as relaxed as you are in the future? Yeah. Um, are you following our race uh, for that nomination in Missouri at all? Yeah, quite a bit because I know some of the players. You know, I know Vicki Hartzler well. Uh, obviously, I don't know... Uh, 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 Greitens very well. I know the stories behind him. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, Schmidt's been all over the news based upon masking. Uh, so, you know, we're following that. I, I actually traveled to Ukraine the last time I went with Vicky because she, of her position on the House Armed Services Committee. We visited our troops in the West. We went to the Capitol. Uh, so, uh, uh, I've served with her a long time and I'm a big fan. Well, earlier in our show, we talked to uh, former Senator Jack Danforth, uh, floated the idea, which I assume you saw about an independent candidacy. Uh, any thoughts about that? And also, while we're talking about people I know you know, uh, in response to that, Billy Long, uh, who was a former colleague of yours, right. nominated uh, Vicki Hartzler, who you just mentioned, as a good candidate for that independent position. No. <laughs> so, well, you know... If you know Billy Long, like something he say, would it, is it so? Yeah. So what what do you uh, yeah. what do you make of that idea? Do you think there's there's obviously we talked about it earlier. There's a pretty big split right now in your party, um, and um, what do you think? Well, you're a political observer, and I taught it in high school, and now I'm teaching it at the local university. And uh, third party candidates don't win. Mm. Okay. They just don't win. So you can do it, but then then yeah. the Republicans who move in that direction, my 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 position would be get involved in and and get the person elected from your party who who you want to send to the general election. That's hey, Al, Alvin. We need to have him on the first part of the show. No, know. that's what. Wait, you I'm just gonna say. Uh, Bill, Bill McClellan schooled us on this uh, you know, yeah, about a half hour ago. <laughs> And, and it, we should be, we, he's a wise man, and we definitely should have listened to him. I'm having all kind of issues today, aren't I? Yeah, this is our technology. <laughs> Hold my calls, will you please? Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I wish you'd have been on instead of me for the first part of this. Mm. No, all right, we're down to the last two. Uh, Congressman Shimkus, uh, 
you, you, you said you did 24 years. I, I'm pretty good at math. You ran 12 times. Is that too many times? Do you wish that you didn't have to run for office every two years? Uh, well, I don't even, that's a great question, but it'll never change because, okay. you know, because senators will not want members of Congress being around midterm to run against them. It be a constitutional change. And so it, theoretically, I actually ran more than two years on the ballot since 1988. So, uh, I and I'm not on the ballot this year. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not too late. You can run as an independent. <laughs> Are you ready to announce tonight you're running for governor of Illinois? Uh, no, I have a great candidate. You ought well, to that's, have. I was, my next question was, do you have a, uh, that, that election's coming up, uh, do you have a candidate in mind? Yeah, Richard Irvin, uh, the mayor of the second largest city in the state of Illinois, Aurora, uh, compelling life story, um, and actually served in the military, got out of the, uh, uh, his mother was 16 when she had him unmarried, um, and just has done, went back home. I like people who, when they're successful, when they go back home, I, I live in my hometown of Collinsville, yeah, I don't know if you ever drag me out. I'll be buried here one day. All right. And uh, and so that he he has that story. And I okay. I mean, well, Congressman Schiff, th th thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate it. We got to run. These are tough times, and and you, you really helped me understand it. Uh, I look forward to having you on the show again, and maybe it's a little bit more enjoyable talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, and thank you guys for watching Donnie Brook. And next up, have a great week. Donnie Brook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.